This is from Great Controversy, page 666. I always remember where this is because it's 666. Now, um, we've been talking about the judgment of God's people, the investigative judgment. The investigative judgment means investigate. <laughs> it doesn't mean that God doesn't know. It means that he wants to do it with us because we don't know. And then he reveals things that he can cleanse away and, uh, and put on the head of the scapegoat. You know, the sanctuary service at the end of the Day of Atonement where the sins all went. It went on the head of the scapegoat. But that's the sins of God's people. But what happens to the wicked who don't go through that? Do they have a judgment too, an investigative judgment? And they do. And so I'm just going to read that. It's just um, a, a short thing here in, on page 666, Great Controversy. As soon as the books of record are opened, now this is their judgment at the end, and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked. They are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. How about that? I mean, you think about that. You know, Ellen White says that God doesn't do that for his, his people because she said if, if you saw everything at once, you'd die. I mean, it's just that bad. And, and that's the wonderful thing about going through it with Jesus because he just brings up something and you work with him on that and he doesn't bring up 10 things at once you know it'll be just one thing maybe or whatever and and he just um, keeps working with us and very gently um, and so but that's not the way it is for the wicked because they have not gone through the investigative judgment for the righteous and so it's all at once they see just where their feet diverged from the path of purity and holiness just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in the violation of the law of God, the seductive temptations which they encouraged by indulgence in sin, the blessings perverted, the messengers of God despised, the warnings rejected, the waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant heart, all appear as if written in letters of fire. So that's the judgment of the wicked at the end of the thousand years. And so we can praise the Lord. We're either going to go through the judgment now and be cleansed, or we're going to go through that one. It's, you know, we don't have a choice of whether we're going to go through judgment or not. It's either now or then. And so God wants us to just participate with him, just open our hearts to him. Study if you need to see how, how kind and loving God is through this judgment experience that he takes us, this is why it's been so long. You know, it isn't because God wasn't ready to come back yet. It's because he is waiting for his people to be ready to be cleansed so that he can come back and that no one is lost that wants to be saved. And so um, I thought I would read that. Now, I also want to look a little bit at what happens when you do go through it. This is from early writings, and this is the experience, because it doesn't mean that we go through this experience and we have no anxiety or no um, emotional upset at all, uh, because we're coming out of a sinful situation. And because the sin is painful, and the devil is after us at the same time, trying to keep his foothold, then that's where it isn't God making it that way. It is the way we have to do to be operated on, you know, to remove that sin. And so I'm going to go to uh, the shaking. This is in early writings, page 269. And I'll just read a bit of this, uh, a little bit more maybe than... But I have to read enough of it so that you will get the picture of the experience. Now, I truly believe I see no evidence that Ellen White herself um, put the, to, together that the experience of the investigative judgment and the shaking were the same thing. It, it's called the shaking, it, it, and, and it describes it exactly, 
those of us who are going through it, it's the perfect description of it. But, you know, she did not live in the time when it actually happened because she could have, but because the church at that time refused to go on with it, so it was deferred to a generation that would. And so when she's describing this, she doesn't say anywhere, this is a judgment of the living. But I can tell you one thing going through it, it is. Um, so here we go. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. Firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenances. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now and then their faces would light up with the marks of God's approbation. And again, the same solemn, earnest, anxious look would settle upon them. Evil angels crowd, crowded around, pressing darkness upon them to shut out Jesus from their view, that their eyes might be drawn to the darkness that surrounded them, and thus they be led to distrust God and murmur against him. Their only safety was in keeping their eyes directed upward. Angels of God had charge over his people, and as the poisonous atmosphere of evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones, the heavenly angels were continually, see, they're there. God is there, Jesus is there, the angels are there. They're trying to help us through this. The heavenly angels were continually wafting their wings over them to scatter the thick darkness. And so then she sees uh, these, this work of agonizing and pleading. Some would not go through it, and they were, she didn't see them anymore. They drifted out, and, and they were gone. And then she said, I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But his angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. And then she says, I asked the meaning of the shaking, and, and she was told it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Uh, which, of course, he says, buy of me gold tried in the fire, and the, this is the counsel he gives the Laodicean church, and so forth. You uh, are familiar with that in Revelation, I think it's 3. And so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but then it says, I, uh, the solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely regarded. This testimony from Jesus, this is a testimony from Jesus, must work deep repentance. All who truly receive it will obey it and be purified. Now that's where we want to go. The purification is at the end of this. And they go in and out of it. She describes it sometimes they're in it and then they have light upon them and they're okay for a while and then they go into it. Well, this is exactly what happens as anybody uh, here that came with me could tell you. It's just exactly like that. But this, um, these quotations here, this chapter in uh, early writings has been a tremendous encouragement in going through it because when you're going through the dark part of it, it's like you'll never get out. And, and, and the reason is because the demons are there. Now let's examine why they're there. Why are they allowed to be there? Well, let's say for example, and I, I'll take myself again, and this, uh, this time with my father issue, uh, I will go back to when I was three months old and I had colic and I was crying and my father came in, my mother told me this, of course I couldn't remember, uh, but my psyche remembered, my inner self remembered, and when the Lord brought it up, I, it was just like I was there and I could see myself you know, doing this. Because your brain has everything recorded in it, uh, in, in your brain, everything is recorded. And it's permanently recorded until you're cleansed. Um, so I, I can talk about that maybe a little bit later. But anyway, and when he, uh, I had colic and I was crying, and, uh, and he, my mother said he took me and shook me. Um, and from that time on, I think that's where my anger toward my father began. Um, so when I was going through the cleansing, and I've gone through layers of cleansing because it goes, I mean, this is a whole lifetime, right? I mean, so it, it doesn't just happen in a moment, and, and I say, please forgive me for being angry with my father, and then it's gone. No, there were all kinds of, this is a 
a tree with lots of rootlets that go into other parts of your life, you know, as you, as you continue throughout your life. Well, when you have a root like that, there is a demonic spirit that is a part of that root. It doesn't just happen. You know, demons uh, are there to access you. They are there to implant in you as early as they possibly can. They want to implant areas in you that come from them. And so when I was going through this cleansing, and this happened to me probably not even a year ago, I got to the final root on this. Um, and so I was going through another time, a wave of uh, reaction toward you know, things that I thought was unfair or whatever. Where does this come from? Where does it come from? So I was praying about it. And uh, I always have gone back to that three month period and I thought that was the end of it. And I thought, you know, my, my father did not understand me. He misinterpreted that I was crying because I was angry and that's why he shook me. And he recognized it because he, he has the same root because he got it from his mother and she got it too and you know it goes back. And so I thought uh, that it started there because he misread me and he was saying I was angry and he was wrong. And so finally I, I went through another layer of it and I was praying about it and the Lord said, your father was right, you were angry. And he said, you were angry because you were hurting and instead of just being a, a sweet little baby crying because it's hurting, I was not only crying because I was hurting, I was crying because I was angry because I was hurting. Now that comes from back, you know, that comes from, from my grandmother, my, my father, you know, he used to say to me, you just like, you're just like me, you have red hair and I have red hair and we have temper. And I thought, I do not. <laughs> it's like... Well, I didn't know I did until I got a redheaded little boy, and I thought, okay, it was almost like Eric was, was my, my father now, only he's little and I'm big. And when I was little and my father was big, but now, you know, where the tables are turned. And so God has to let us go through experiences that bring things out. But it was so interesting that when the Lord told me that was not true, you were angry. Well, then what could I do? I could confess it and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for showing me. I didn't know that. I was so thrilled to find out the truth. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What is it that causes a demon to have any access to you at all? Lies. And so the devil tries to lie to us as early as possible. Not only that, but demons are passed on from generation to generation. That's why in the Bible it says, to the third and fourth generation. Do you know that God required the prayers of his people back in those days to go back to the third and fourth generation? You'll see it if you do a study on it. He required them, or asked them to, whether they did it or not, to uh, confess to the third and fourth generation of the fathers upon the children. It says that even in the Ten Commandments, and so this, this is passed on down. And I have stories about my grandmother, uh, my father's mother. And uh, I didn't do any cleansing until just not too long ago about my grandmother. That's another thing I had to do. And I heard about her uh, from my father. And he was very proud of her because um, this is way back in the day. And she was a teacher. And she was a teenager. And she taught in this little school where there were big boys that, you know, probably 20 years old or whatever, because they had to work on the farm and they didn't get their, their education, so they had to keep going. So here she's in this little country school. I'm from West Virginia and uh, out in the hills of nowhere, you know, and, and so they had their little country schools. Well, she was the, the marm, the school marm, and they, all these big boys drove all the other teachers away. So they asked my grandmother, about five foot two, and they asked her to uh, teach, and she took, the, took it, and uh, she got her a big stick up at the desk. And she, I don't know what she did, but she got to stay and wasn't driven away. And so I hear these stories all my life, right? And my father is so proud of her. 
And then I'm glad he told me these stories because when I was being cleansed of this anger thing in me, the Lord took me all the way back and said, some of this is going all the way back to your grandmother. She had that same thing. I don't think you're going to take over me. Here's my big stick. And there was something in me that was like that. Now, no, I, I didn't know I had all in, in me, but there would be a point where I would come to and I would feel like you can kill me, you can do anything you want to me, but you will never get over me. I felt that way about my father. There were times I felt that way about my husband. There were times I felt that way about my children. And so uh, God had to cleanse that. Is that, a, is that from Jesus? No, it was, from my, it was from my grandmother, but it was from the devil, you see. And so the devil is at the root of every root. He's the one that tells you something, and you buy that lie, and from then on, it is in there. Now, science has now discovered that the brain, and especially the amygdala part of the brain, uh, it's in there somewhere, some little almond-shaped thing, uh, that uh, records, it's, it's the part of your brain that records your emotions and your emotional reactions. I didn't bring my book with me today, but the, I have a book uh, that was written, I think it's in 19, five, uh, 2005, where uh, there's a whole book showing how to help children not have root problems. Because, let's say for example, and it's in the book, an example is um, that mother and a little boy, three years old, is, uh, they're out for a walk, and while they're in the walk in the park, here comes this dog, and it's rushing up to them, and it's growling and baring its teeth and barking right in the little boy's face, and he's terrified. And, he, and, and in his amygdala, emotional reactions, all dogs are scary and bite. Well... Our pastor some years ago, not the pastor we have now, but a pastor some years ago, uh, we had a um, special weekend when the, Ron and Nancy Rocky came in and they were talking about this, that things are passed on, you know, and in the DNA from parent to child and so forth. And uh, he was examining himself for any roots, and he said, uh, huh, he said, I, when I was four years old, my father was a minister, and we, he would take me door to door to visit parishioners and other people. And he said at this one house, there was this dog came out and did this very thing, this, you know, acting like he's going to, you know, bite and growl and whatever. And it scared him so badly, I don't think he was bitten. I don't know. I can't remember. Because probably father was right there to protect him. But anyway, uh, that was four years old. Now he's an adult and he has grown children, and he said he, all of his life since then, and when he and his wife and children, or, or any, just he and his wife would go for a walk, he always takes a big stick because he might meet a dog. Now, that came from him when he was four years old. So you see, everything that we've ever gone through that we haven't worked through and given to Jesus, we have to work through and give to Jesus and let him heal that so that our pastor doesn't have to go with a big stick anymore, afraid of every dog. Now, he can if he wants to, but he needs to be, that needs to be resolved in his mind. Because if he is still, let's say he went to heaven, he'd be afraid of the dogs up there too. You see what I'm saying? We have to be cleansed right here. And, uh, and, and God, and Jesus wants to do that. He wants to heal all these things. Uh, so these are the things that, that we struggle with, this work of agonizing and pleading that we see here, but then we get on the other side, and it says we will obey, the, and Jesus is working through. You know, my daughter, who is, who is a teacher, uh, has, has learned how to do this with children, and she's a kindergarten teacher, and pre-K and whatever for years, the one that's sitting back here, and uh, I'd like to have her tell the story, but I don't know whether uh, I need to do that this time. Uh, she can come here and give a whole seminar herself, which she does. And um, so and some of her stuff is on YouTube. You can get it. Her name is Karen Steyer. So anyway, um, that she has learned that you can, at the onsa, ons, 
onslaught, wherever the root problem begins, if you know how, you can help that child to work it through right on the spot so that it doesn't even become a root and the devil doesn't get a hold of it. So, you know, we can have healing afterwards or during or whatever it is, God wants to heal us. And, and if we have children, you know, how are children going to be cleansed? I think the only way children, or especially little ones, is because they have parents who know, who, who understand the cleansing and can help their children to go through it and to be cleansed by Jesus or to stop it before it even becomes a root and go through it. So Jesus is doing an awesome work right now. But what's going to happen when we're done? Said the angel, list ye. Soon I heard a voice like many in musical instruments, all sounding in perfect strains, sweet and harmonious. It surpassed any music I had ever heard, seeming to be full of mercy, compassion, and elevating holy joy. It thrilled through my whole being, said the angel, look ye. My attention was then turned to the company I had seen who were mightily shaken. I was shown those whom I had before seen weeping and praying in agony of spirit. And I want to tell you something, we do. You know, those of us who are going through that, uh, there are times where we actually weep and pray in agony of spirit, not because Jesus is making us that way, but because we're going through the cleansing of that out and giving it up and, and, and being rid of the demons. When I get through one of these cleansing, and we all know that, and by the way, we do have a material here. Um, I don't know whether, do we have one on the, on the cleansing prayer uh, out there? Okay, you want to stand up just and, and show them what you have there? Uh, this is hot off the press. Uh, Jean Marie, who is right here with us with, his, uh, with uh, her husband David, and this is Krista, and she's holding this. And together they have been working on a cleansing prayer where you can actually see the steps in how to be completely freed and cleansed of these things from the past. And uh, so you can have one of these as well. As there are other things out that we will be showing. But um, that's from the experience that we have had to help people through it very quickly and uh, so forth. Okay, then it shows, says, I was shown those whom I had before seen weeping and praying in agony of spirit. The company of guardian angels around them had been doubled. Don't you love it? Yes. Doubled. Amen. Oh, I mean, it's just awesome. And it, and it really is. When you feel this cleansing, it just seems like the Holy Spirit and the angels just surround you, you know, with, with light and with protection and love. It, it's, it's a wonderful experience to get on the other side of, of this cleansing experience. They moved in exact order like a company of soldiers. Their countenances expressed the severe conflict which they had endured, the agonizing struggle which they had passed through. Yet their features, marked with severe internal anguish, now shone with the light and glory of heaven. They had obtained the victory, and it called forth from them the deepest gratitude and holy, sacred joy. That is a privilege that we all want, to come to that place where, where you, it, and there's no, no pride in it at all, because when you go through this experience of cleansing, you know that Jesus is everything. He's everything, because he did it. We just participated. But he did it. You can never do it on your own. With Jesus, it's, it is a, is a gift of relationship with him. The numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. The careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to personally plead and uh, agonize for it did not obtain it. And they were left behind in darkness and their places were immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. Evil angels still pressed around them, but could have no power over them. Evil angels have power, evil power, power to oppress, power to discourage. A couple of weeks ago, I... Um, was going through something, I don't know, remember what. And that, I, I have no idea but I, what it was, but all I know is that I got up in the morning and it had been kind of a dark night, and when I have darkness at night, I always get up in the morning and I pray and I say, Lord, 
you know, is there, is there some reason why I feel some darkness around me and I start questioning the Lord and getting answers so that I can be free. And so um, as I was walking into my prayer room, which is my study and, and so forth, um, I felt as I walked into my room, there was this huge dark presence. I think it's the worst that I've ever felt. And it was just like it was enveloping me and I felt like it was taking hold of my whole body, not my mind, but my whole body was under the power of a demonic spirit, and I knew that. And I, it just seemed like it was a huge presence. And um, so I've been through so many of these battles that I thought, I'm not even going to take any time to do anything. I'm, I got down on my knees, and I thought, the only thing that's going to break this presence is the Bible. So I just knelt there. And I could feel it all through my body as I'm kneeling there, right? I, I hope you don't experience that. But you know, when, you're, when you are fighting these, these, um, these battles and you're telling other people how to get free, demons don't like you. And they would like to kill you. <laughs> and I know they would like to kill all of us who are going through this because, because you see, they're losing the battle now. And they've been, they've been fighting for not only the 6,000 years of this world, but however long it was in heaven, to try to win the battle over God. And now they're seeing people getting free, permanently free. And as it says in early writings there, that, uh, that, that the evil angels still pr uh, press around them, but have no power over them. So you see how desperate they are to hold on to you, any little thing. So here's this demonic uh, presence. So I just opened the Bible to Psalms and Isaiah. Those are my favorite places to go. And I found what it was, you know, prayer, warrior type things in here. And I just read out loud. I just read and read and read and read. And for a, I wasn't afraid, but I just, because I knew as long as I am with the Lord, as long as I'm reading his scriptures, I am safe. This is a sword of the spirit, the word of God. That's the sword of the spirit for spiritual demons too. And so I just kept reading and reading out loud. And all of a sudden, I felt a little bit of light, a little bit of, you know, a lifting of the oppression. And I, I just kept reading and reading. And all of a sudden, I felt back myself again. You know, it came back into my normal self. And I praise the Lord. This is the armor of God, the whole armor of God. This is part of that armor. The word of God, the sword of the spirit, the power that it has is not your power. It is the power of God unto salvation. So you don't have to be afraid of these demons that don't want you to be a part of the end time people. So then, after they did this, uh, and, they, and the evil, uh, they have the victory, the evil angels have no power of them anymore, and then it says, I heard those clothed with the armor. Oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> I heard those clothed with the armor, uh, the armor of God. I was just um, speaking of that, and that's exciting. Speak forth the truth with great power. It had effect. Many had been bound, some wives, but their husbands, and so forth. The honest... Uh, had uh, in heart all came and they they were rejoicing and they joined the other people and then it says i asked what had made this great change an angel answered it is the latter rain the refreshing from the presence of the lord the loud cry of the third angel so are we waiting for that do we want that yeah. you can have it it's time for it not to put it off into some far distant future when i don't know what you know, is going to happen, and then it's going to ha you know, the latter rain is going to fall. No, it is available now, but there is a price to pay, and that is wrestling with Jesus. Not wrestling against him, but he's wrestling with you. He is the one that's beside you. He has conquered every demon on the cross of Calvary, and now he will conquer all the same demons because they don't die. They're still there, you know, trying to win against him, but now through his people, and Jesus is right there by your side, and he is coaching you, holding you, impressing you what to do. And when you obey him, the evil angels, the power of them will be broken. And then we can have the latter rain and the refreshing. We'll need a refreshing, right? 
And it is a refreshing. It's, it's a wonderful refreshing, the loud cry. And so we don't have to say, well, we'll have to evangelize you know, in every part of the globe. That's wonderful. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But let's let Jesus guide that instead of us saying, well, let's see. How many more churches should we you know, build uh, you know, in a committee meeting somewhere? Jesus wants to finish this now, and he, and he will finish it if he has a people. That's what he's waiting for. Not more evangelism, although that's fine. We will be preaching, but the preaching under the latter reign will bring in the people very quickly all around the world. We don't have to go in boats or walking or on a donkey somewhere, you know, like they did in, back in Jesus' day. And even in one generation, they went through the whole then-known world. What about now? We have videos and we have you know, cell phones and we have all manner of things. And this can be done very quickly. He's waiting for a people, not just uh, you know, for more something else that human beings can think up to do. Yes, we need to do it, but we need to have the power of the latter rain. And it will go very quickly then. And, and Jesus will come back. Now, I just want to run through a little bit of um, the concept of the trumpets. And so I want to go to in finishing here, just to throw out some things for you. And I do have a book um, called Countdown, Seven Trumpets for Today. But the Lord gave me a new way of doing this that is faster than what I have been doing before because the Lord told me about the trumpets back in 2001 when the towers went down and that that was the first trumpet uh, of the repeat. You see, as a people we have had since 1844, 1843, 42, actually in the, in the 40s, uh, we have had understanding of the historicist or historical trumpets. And that's a whole study in itself. Um, but we have believed since that time um, that the historical trumpets were, the first one was the first hit on Rome and it took four trumpets and I just don't wanna go through a lot of this. Four trumpets, this is our, our doctrines. Okay. These are not doctrines, but these are beliefs. You know, our doctrines are bedrock, but th this is a belief that has been propagated uh, ever since 1844. But anyway, the first, the first four trumpets brought Rome down. The first trumpet was the first hit on the mainland of Rome. And so then you have in the fourth trumpet, you have uh, the uh, demise of the pagan Rome gives rise to papal Rome in the fourth trumpet. The little horn power comes out, you know, and uh, so you have the, the fourth trumpet. And then uh, the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet, trumpets are uh, the, the two woes. The third woe is the seventh trumpet, which is the coming of Jesus. And then those two woes in Revelation 9 are Muslim hordes, the Muslims. So... Then uh, what, th what they did back in 1844 is that, uh, if you know the story, some of you may know the story and some not, but uh, William Miller was trying to figure out a timing because he was trying to figure out when Jesus would come, and the seventh tr uh, trumpet is the coming of Jesus. So William Miller was trying to figure that out because he had the 2300 days, you know, and all that. Well, he didn't know what to do with the numbers that are in the sixth, fifth and sixth trumpets exactly. So Josiah Litch studied this, and Josiah Litch put the numbers in the fifth trumpet and the numbers in the sixth trumpet together, back to back, without a stop, and he came up with the demise of the Turks in, on August 11, 1840. And it happened on that day. Well, this gave impetus, when that happened in 1840, it gave impetus to the preaching of the message of Jesus coming. And they said, well, if they can nail it down to a day, then it's okay to believe they can nail it down to, you know, uh, October uh, of um, 
22 of 1844. So it really went after that. It was a big, important thing. Well, of course, he didn't come. And it's because they weren't ready. They hadn't gone through the judgment yet. Remember, I read that from Great Controversy. Uh, four, page 445, I believe it is. Anyway, um, so what I want to do is now go back because the trumpets are still a timeline. Why? Because Jesus didn't come yet. <laughs> and the seventh trumpet is his coming. And so uh, I just want to go back to Revelation 10, where you have the message of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, beliefs or the Advent, Advent belief. And you see here in Revelation 10, I'm going to start with five. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, there will be no more, and it says delay in here, in the King, King James it says there will be time no longer. And we, our doctrine is there will be no more prophetic time any longer after 1844. So, okay, we're, we are understanding that. No more prophetic time where they can set it, you can set a day, October 22 or August 11 or whatever. No, there'll be no more of those. That doesn't mean that, that uh, we won't know anything about anything, though. And so that's what uh, I want to pull out. Um, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to the servants his prof the prophets. Now, okay, that's where they were. In the days when the seventh angel, which is um, here in... The seventh angel is in Revelation 11, verse 15 and on. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones worshipped and so forth, and they sang uh, to him, and the time has come for judging the dead and rewarding your servants and so forth. Um, and so... This whole uh, seventh trumpet is when Jesus comes, as it says, and the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Has that happened yet? No. It's, and, and in the Bible, the last trump is when Jesus comes and blows the trumpet on his way down, and we hear it, and so forth. Okay, and that's, oh, that's our belief. That's not Carol Zarska making this up. So... We go back to verse uh, 7, where, where it says, But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet. So where are we? He's about to sound his trumpet. He's about to come. In those days, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. The mystery of God, and that's a whole study in itself, but you know what it is, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And there's a number of places where the mystery that has been hidden from the foundation of the world is Christ in you, the hope of glory, in the New Testament. Paul especially writes about that. So in the days just before Jesus comes, the mystery of God in him living in us, a finished product, will be finished. And aren't we just talking about that in the cleansing? The result of his work in the most holy place is to finish the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, but is Christ going to be able to live in us in areas where the devil has a hold on us and still is, is you know, causing us to fall? No. The cleansing, then the mystery of, uh, of God's people, and that's why the 144,000 are blameless because of the cleansing and then the infilling of the Spirit. And so here we have saying that just before Jesus comes, which is where we are, the cleansing will take place, and then the mystery of God will be finished. But since we are still in that, 
and Jesus, the, the seventh trumpet has not blown yet. I want to read here in verse 9 of chapter 10. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. What is that in our, in our forefathers? It, yeah, 1844. It was sweet as honey. Jesus is coming. And then it was, it was bitter. It was a bitter disappointment, a terrible disappointment when he didn't. And so then it says, I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again to many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. You must, what? Prophesy. Then if we're going to prophesy, which is speaking for God, of course, but he's saying, you prophesied in 1844 and it didn't take place, but you must prophesy about Jesus coming again. Somebody's got to do the prophesying. Now, that doesn't mean that you're prophets. It means that, like them, we see in Scripture things that other people have not, and we will know when he is coming again. And so we've been talking about all the different ways that we see it in the, in the earth and so forth. But I want to just zero in for just a few minutes now on the trumpets, because this whole message is in the context of the seven trumpets of Revelation, the end trumpets. Well, if you have a seventh trumpet, and then you have a sixth trumpet, because it's not, the seventh trumpet hasn't sounded yet here, and we must prophesy again. So we're somewhere in the sixth or fifth, or fourth or whatever. It's very interesting that um, Ellen White says that Revelation will be repeated only very fast and uh, very quick, and we will have the same prophecies again, so we're prophesying again. So I'm going to read a couple of those things to you here. In the great co final conflict, Satan will employ the same policy, manifest the same spirit, and work for the same end as in all preceding ages. That which has been will be, except that the coming struggle will be marked with a terrible intensity such as the world has never witnessed. Great Controversy 11, which I think is the prologue or the beginning of it before it starts in chapter 1. Um, and then she says, um, each of the ancient prophets spoke less of their own time than for ours so that their prophesying is in force for us. The Bible has accumulated and bound up its treasures for the last generation. All the great events and solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are repeating themselves in these last days. That's 3SM 338 and 9. And uh, there are others too. Um, but I want to read one that's important for our discussion right at the moment. Um, we are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Many of the prophecies are about to be fulfilled in quick succession. Every element of power is about to be set to work. Past history will be repeated. Old controversies will arouse to new life and peril will, be bes will beset God's people on every side. Intensity is taking hold of the human family. It is permeating everything upon earth. Study Revelation in connection with Daniel, for history will be repeated. Will be repeated. Are we in a repeat of some sort right now? What do you think? I, and I can just give you a few de details of some repeat. Um, that's Testimonies to Ministers, page 116. Let's see. There's one other one that I wanted to. Um, at the moment, and I don't want to take time to look for it, 
uh, she says in another place, which I can find a little bit later, because I have it in the Bible, <laughs> written in my margins, um, that she says, if we realized and understood the prophecies of revelation, that uh, there would be a great revival among our people. So that's what we're looking for. We were looking for revival, right? We want to be revived, and just knowing that Jesus' coming is so soon should create a revival in our hearts so that we can prepare and get ready for that time. Um, oh, yeah, here it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm still going to read it. It's 644. It's way over here somewhere. Okay. Okay, this is from Testimonies of Ministers 118. The perils of the last days are upon us, and we are to warn the people of the danger they are in. If our people realize the nearness of the events portrayed in the Revelation, a reformation would be wrought in our churches and many more would believe the message. We have no time to lose. God calls upon us to watch for souls as they must give an account. So the understanding of revelation for the final generation is what's going to bring about a revival of our people. So we must prophesy again. And what are we to prophesy again? Um, I'm going to close in 10 minutes. So I'm just going to run through this really quickly. Um, there is a very clear repeat in Revelation of something. So Bible students, um, where is a very clear repeat in Revelation of something that happened before? The papacy, yeah, the papacy. And that's Revelation 13. We have the beast out of the sea. And the dragon gave him his, his power and his authority. And then it says in verse 3, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also <coughs> worshipped the beast. Now, in this same chapter Revelation 13, we have something else happening at the same time and, and grouping together with the beast out of the sea. And that starts in Revelation 13, 11. So what is that one? The beast out of the earth. So that's the United States. So now we have, as, as you Bible students uh, know, that we have a coalition of the United States with the papacy. This is a repeat of history because the, the beast arose from Rome. And now the beast is now rising again through the Amer America. That's in prophecy. The interesting thing about it is that it's the repeat. You see, some people say, there's no repeat. It's like, whoa, that's a repeat, isn't it? There's no repeat. And, and that is in the trumpets because the, uh, in the other trumpets, they, it, it arose in the fourth one. Okay, the fourth trumpet in the historicist view. Does anybody know what trumpet number one of the historicist view was? <coughs> what? The first trumpet. The first trumpet was the first hit on the mainland of... Of, of Rome, and it took four to get, bring it down. Okay, you can look that up in history. And it's in our uh, commentaries and whatever. That's, is the first, uh, the first historicist one is the first hit on Rome. Now we are Rome, so to speak. We're joining. What it was the first hit on the mainland of America? What? The Twin Towers is the first hit on the mainland. Now, 
uh, if you if you want to go quickly down through, I am going to use the words of someone else to show you what I believe and how I believe the Lord showed me. Now I dropped it. Um, just a minute. Um, showed me in 2001 that that was the beginning of the trumpets. Thank you, son. When the towers went down, it was a great tragedy. The first book that came out on that was Morning's Trumpet by Lewis Walton. It came out in 2001, right after it happened. And he says, Morning's Trumpet, because he believed at that time that it was the beginning of the downfall of America and, and going all the way through to the end. What he didn't catch was that there would be more trumpets. <laughs> and he thought that was it. And, um, but time has told that, it, that there are other trumpets as well. And so I'm going to read here from Hope Channel, their paper that they put out. And this is from 2009. Now, notice these steps. Um, August 2009, Hope Channel. Crises are changing the world. The Pope thinks he has the solution. This is Benedict, by the way, back in that, when he wrote this, they wrote this. Dear friend, the past decade has been traumatic. One crisis after another has assaulted our peace and security. First, there we go, number one. It was the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. Then, in 2005, the most devastating hurricane season in recorded history wiped out New Orleans and numerous other cities. Next, the housing bubble erupted, sending a shockwave through the economy. Most recently, financial institutions have collapsed. The stock market has crashed, and businesses are struggling to survive. The cumulative fallout has been devastating. Millions are out of work, out of their homes, and out of hope. Now, in 2001, when that happened, I, I was reading um, that very day that the, the, uh, the towers came down. I, was, I went and was reading in volume nine of the testimonies. And you know what that is. Let's see if I can find it. And that is her vision or dream of the towers coming down. Now, I just want to examine that just a little bit here. This is 9011. <laughs> I think that's so interesting. 911. And the name of it for the coming of the king, that chapter. The last crisis. So she's pretty well nailed this down, right? Then she says, the spirit of God is gradually being, surely being withdrawn from the earth, plagues and so forth. And she goes on uh, about the terrible things that are happening. And then on, on verse, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, page 12, she says, on one occasion when in New York City I was in the night season called upon to behold buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproofed and they were erected to glorify their owners and builders. And she goes on to say, the Lord was not in their thoughts. The scene that next passed before me, uh, page 13, was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly Fireproof buildings and said they are perfectly safe, but these buildings were consumed as if they had been made of pitch. That's what it was like, too. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. I am instructed that when the Lord's time comes, should no change have taken place in the hearts of proud, ambitious human beings, men will find that the hand that has been strong to save will be strong to destroy. And we are seeing our country go down in the, in the trumpets. That's what we're really seeing. Just like Rome, for the same reason, too. Because the papacy is being coddled and accepted 
And it was at that time that these things happened. Um, I noticed that there was a pattern of, of um, when the economy went down in 29, that that was right after in February of 29, the um, papacy was reestablished over in, in Rome. And then in the fall, the, the economy went down. So it was interesting that in the spring of the, when our economy fell in September of, of nine, eight, excuse me, that the Pope came over and uh, that was when Bush was in office and he met him there and, and they said, what do you see? It wouldn't, when you looked at the, in the eyes of the Pope, what did you see? And he said, I saw God. And in the fall, the economy fell. There, there's a pattern here, you know. If that's who your God is, the Lord says, all right, let's see if he can hold up your economy. Not exactly like that, but there's a cause and effect. And then she, um, she says, um, she starts quoting uh, scriptures. And as I was reading this, I finally came to one of the scriptures she was quoting, just scripture after scripture about the, you know, the whole earth is being uh, coming down and, and disasters and all that sort of thing without making any comment. And then she finally quoted, as I was reading it, Jeremiah 4. <coughs> without any comment. Um, this is Jeremiah 4, 19. O oh, my anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain. O oh, the agony of my heart. My heart pounds within me. I cannot keep silent, for I have heard the sound of the trumpet. I have heard the battle cry. Now, in King James it says, I am pained at my very heart. I cannot hold my peace. Because thou hast heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. And she just quotes it in, the, in just another page or so in the same chapter without saying anything about it. Just let the reader decide what the Holy Spirit is let, reading or is helping us to see. And when I read that, I said, okay, that's the first trumpet. Because the Lord had told me years ago, you will know when the trumpets begin, uh, when they happen. And so I knew that, and then the Lord helped me to see that, that you know, this and this and this was going to happen uh, as the trumpets went on, and they happened just that way. So I'm going to go back to the Hope Channel paper, and they, uh, they say here, our world is going through change of prophetic proportions. Prophetic proportions? about all of this, that's what they're saying. World leaders recognize something unusual is happening. Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom recently said, historians will look back and say this was no ordinary time, but a defining moment, an unprecedented period of global change, and a time when one chapter ended and another began. Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister, which is what he said back, back then when this was happening. What Mr. Gordon probably can't appreciate, goes on in the paper, is that this new chapter that has begun is found in Revelation 13. This predicts a time when global crisis prompts church and state to unite in a tragic union. This was written in 2009. Here we are in 2018. This is nine years later, isn't it? Yes. Nine years later, and what we have seen since then of this going down, our, our, the whole thing going down. And of course, we've seen the papacy, and, and he's, he came over in 2015 and spoke to our Congress and to uh, the UN and to other things. And uh, at that time, I had a Time magazine that said that he was voted as the most popular um, religio-political leader in the world at that time. So where are we? And since then, there has been what? The, the um, healing of the wound. That's what they called it. 
You know, isn't that incredible? It's like, wake up, people. <laughs> we must prophesy again because we're seeing the same things happen, only very, as Ellen White says, in very rapid succession now. Not long periods of time, but one thing right after another is happening. And we're seeing all of this happen, and yet, what are we waiting for to prophesy again? Oh no, we don't want to do that because we don't know, you know, I mean, you never know whether it's, this is it, or maybe it's generations to come. And, and, you know, we have to prepare to make sure that our children and grandchildren have schools and hospitals and, and all kinds of things that we know. We, I mean, I, this is what you hear. That's why we're building more buildings. That's why we're building new big hospitals that I won't name where. And things that are going on as if we're going to be here for generations. No. Jesus said when you see all of these things happen, that is the generation. It's not going to go on. So all of these things are happening, and we're right before the seventh, in, in uh, trumpet to sound, we're in the time of that, and there's going to be a lot of things happen. But one of the things that, are ha that happen uh, before Jesus comes is the close of probation. And that is a serious thought, because usually we think about, we think about Jesus coming, but don't hear much about the close of probation. When Jesus finishes his work in the second apartment, what happens? He stands up and the plagues fall and probation has closed. Now, we're very close to that, very close, and that would be a whole other sermon, and I'm not going to do that today, but I just want you to know how close we are to the close of probation. And I just want you to know that it's a wonderful thing. We're going to go home soon. Amen. We're going to see an end to this. Who wants to continue to live in a world that some people who have a lot of money are trying to figure out how to build something that they can blast off from here and go to some other planet somewhere and really, truly, and, and, fi and, and, and build a new, um, a new generation up there because this one's going to blow up any time. And you know, and they're, and they're watching Yellowstone because they say if that thing goes, it's going to wipe us all out. We don't even need a no nuclear war, <laughs> just Yellowstone. And fortunately, I'm not afraid of those because Jesus is going to hold it together until he comes. When he comes, everything blows up, you know? And, there, and all the towers go down, and all the cities are, are broken down, and everything happens that we're seeing little bits of. The whole thing will happen when he comes, and he takes us home to be with him forever, and the great controversy will be over. What a wonderful day. It's coming soon. We can be there. We can be cleansed. We can be a part of the generation that will live to see him come because this is it. Praise the Lord for that. I hope you all are happy with that and not feeling depressed. This is exciting. This is, we're, we're going to go on the greatest, you know, uh, spaceship that there ever was, you know. The angels and Jesus, and they're going to take us to heaven. I'm just so excited about that day. But in the meantime, there's a work to be done. There's a work in our own lives. There's a cleansing, the sealing, and the latter rain, and then there's a loud cry. There's the loud cry of Revelation 18. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and receive not of her plagues. That's what we'll be preaching next. But we have to be ready because we can't, we can't pre preach to a people come out of her sins when we're still in them ourselves. It's a cleansed people that preaches the Revelation 18, come out of her sins message. Well, you've all been a very wonderful group, and I am thankful for your love and your kindness and the Holy Spirit that's been poured out today, totally poured out. And we, we, we want more and more of it, don't we? This is a foretaste of the glory of the full outpouring of latter rain. So uh, I just want to encourage all of you, and um, we can just bow our heads and have a closing prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have been working for centuries and centuries to bring this about. And I know all of heaven is, 
is, is saying hallelujah. God's people are, are getting ready. They're, his bride is making herself ready. And we want to be among those cleansed remnant that can sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, the cleansed people that you are bringing about. We can't do it, Lord. There's nothing in us that gives us the power to do that. But you can, and we want to cooperate with you and love you and follow you because you have promised us that those who go through this experience, the called, chosen, and faithful, will follow you wherever you go. And we want to be following you now so that we can follow you throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.